God, I thank you. Lord, I thank you for uh, the grace that uh, you've given us to each person in this room today. Lord, to be able to, to be alive, uh, to, to be having our existence inside of Christ. Lord, that, that we have purpose. Lord, even when we feel frail, God, you give, you give us supernatural spiritual strength and sustenance and sustenance, Lord, that we might walk with you. And so, Lord, uh, we pray, God, that you would take your word as we look at it together tonight and that your Holy Spirit would just come upon us for for wisdom, for, for revelation, uh, and application, uh, both corporately and personally and practically, Lord. And, uh, and that you would just speak to us. And, and let, let the word not just be something that we hear and we take note of and think minutes. Okay, that's good, that's nice, that's helpful. But Lord, may you give us the unction from the Spirit to help us to actually these things, Lord, to be uh, cognizant of them in an applicative way. We might be doers of the word and so be blessed and so be God. That's where the substance really lies, Lord. Just, just being able to lovingly obey you because you've laid down your life and done so much for us. So we might experience where your kingdom coming and your will being done in us and through us. Lord. That's what I want to make. <laughs> I hope everybody um, receives from you tonight something uh, that will bless them. And uh, we just ask you to speak to us now. Open up our hearts to your word and your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. So, if you got a copy of the Bible with you, um, <coughs> any of the elders been tracking in Zechariah chapter 5, is where we'll be tonight. It's a <coughs> short chapter, praise God. <laughs> really, really a simple one. There's a uh, I typically love to, to get into etymology and the beginning of the book and just the historicity and all this type of stuff, but I have a sense that a lot of this has already been expounded upon and discussed since we're in the middle of Zechariah. There's really two points. I mean, you can say there's more than two points as we get into the text. You'll see yourself. Um, that I think the Lord is trying to speak in this chapter, and I think it's it's very applicable to our lives today and in our culture in which we live today. So there's something to, to, to rein in from it, to gather from it. There's a count of three things, eight visions that we see in Zechariah. This is number seven of eight, that, um, or six and seven that we'll be talking about tonight. The eighth one is there in chapter six, the first part. So, um, Whoever's on that is going to catch up on that and look at that one. But uh, I'm going to read the first few verses here. This is, again, um, uh, you know, I hadn't listened to the past few studies of the other elders' talks, so I don't want to infringe on anybody's stuff. But we're seeing visions that the Lord has given to Zechariah the prophet. And I'm just going to jump into the verses here um, in Zechariah chapter 5, verse 1. And this is, I think it's number 6. Of the eight visions that have been laid out, if you want to count them like that. Um, verse 5, or chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Then I turned, this speaking of Zechariah, and raised my eyes and saw there a flying scroll. Now, some of these other, scroll, other visions, they seem, you know, practical, relatable, you know, priest, lampstand, some of the the sustenance of the lampstand and or continue to burn. That was pretty interesting um, in chapter 4. But, you know, you see a flying scroll and you got to keep in mind Zechariah lives in ancient times. So uh, he's not mesmerized by our media and every weird cotton picking image and imagination and vision that exists out there. So this is probably pretty substantial. And if we saw something like that, ah, whatever, you know. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's seeing this. So it's probably taking him by uh, you know, what is this? You know, he sees this scroll in verse 2. This is an angel speaking back to him. And says, he said to me, what do you see? And so I answered, I see a flying scroll. 
Its length is 20 cubits, and its width is 10 cubits. Now, these measurements mentioned here are mentioned in other places in the Bible. So we have something to compare these measurements to. It's actually, um, these measurements fit uh, in line with the, uh, the holy place. And where it's interesting because this is a connection to some of the studies uh, we'll be going through if y'all are here on the Thursday night Bible study with the tabernacle. But the, the holy of holies is actually smaller than this, but the, the most holy place where you enter in before you get to the holy of holies, exact same dimensions uh, mentioned here. It's also the same dimensions of uh, Solomon's uh, porch on the temple. These dimensions mentioned the 20 cubits and the 10 cubits. Um, you're looking at 15 feet by 30 feet, roughly, is what we're looking at here. So you see, it's not, it's not like just some little scroll, like a fairy scroll, tiny. I mean, this is like, you know, 15 by 30 feet is pretty big. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like, whoa, you know, it's like a banner or something, you know, it's flying. It's really huge. But verse 3, it says, Then he said to me, the angel, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole earth. Every thief shall be expelled according to this side of the scroll, and every perjurer shall be expelled according to that side of it. So it's a two-sided uh, piece. In verse 4 it says, I will send out a curse, says the Lord of hosts. It shall enter the house of of the thief in the house of the one who swears falsely by my name and it shall remain in the midst of his house speaking of the curse and consume it with its timbers and stones so this is um, a curse that's just not going to like a stain on the carpet I mean this is like <laughs> Consuming the timbers and the stones, this is pretty thorough uh, allowance of God, of a curse coming upon. Um, we'll just go back here and look at these again, just real quickly. Um, it talks about the face. This is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole earth. So it's, it's pretty extensive in that sense as well. But it's speaking of every thief. That he shall be expelled, according to this side of the scroll, and every perjurer, which you know, perjury, um, and, and then this is right on money with actual Hebrew word and uh, definition, but it's in line under oath. You know, we have that definition that's right in line, a uh, good translation of that. So it's the thieves, and it's those that are lying under oath. That have made an oath, but you know, lying. Um, they shall be expelled according to one side of this. And and it also says there, you know, again addressing the thief in verse 4, but it also adds in one who swears falsely by my name. So there's that, you know, additional. You know, if you want to lay this out, a lot of people look at this in commentators, things just simply put, you know, they're saying this is like basically the Ten Commandments. That is being you know shown forth, and that there's a curse that comes along with violating of those commandments, saying it's been broken on one side, it's been broken on the other side of the commandments. That's one way of describing it, and you know it could be indicative of maybe you know the holy of holies. We spoke about that, you know the comparable the size of this thing. You know you know, you know the holy of holies been supposed to become seen symbolically the presence of God there in the tabernacle. Obviously, in the Holy of Holies, there was the Ark of the Covenant. I think Pastor Neil has spoken to someone about that recently. Where is he getting ready to? <laughs> I don't think we're ready. This is 24. We're 25. But, um, you know, the Ten Commandments are inside of that. Right? So these, these, these pictures, these things line up that direction for, you know, potentially this is part of what's being visualized here. And, and, and as we're looking at this thing, these are visions, you know, um, um, these two visions we're looking at, we look at the first one here in the first four verses, are meant to, to 
purge the evil away from the people of God. That these are evils that basically the people that have been kept in Babylon or you know, taken in Babylon uh, have, 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 have got these things mixed in to their faith um, or mixed in with their, uh, their walk, so to speak, with God, if you will. I want to say that and this is meant to be, you know, a, a vision. This is, this is something that God is making happen uh, to the people that have, you know, because, I mean, Babylonians would be swearing falsely in the name of Yahweh. You know what I mean? <laughs> so so, 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 so there's, there's a sense that that doesn't apply this so much to the Babylonian. Obviously, the curse goes out of the world, but I think there's a lot to take away from this. You know, we'll look at the second part of the vision here in just a second. In a sense of the the simple things that we see that's being described, the thief. You know, we, we see in Ephesians four twenty eight, uh, speaking in the New Testament, you know, people that are getting saved and born again in the kingdom says, if you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good, hard work, and then. Store up for yourself a lot of money for retirement and build storehouses and have stock portfolios and investments and all this extra money laying around and disposable income for your own personal benefit. That was it. I get a copy of that, Mark. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, <laughs> that's the American translation. It's now let's look here. <laughs> that's <laughs> no, but it's, it's no, it's quit stealing. Use your hands for hard work, and then it says, give generously to those in need. Man, where we're at in America these days. And, and I'm guilty, man. I mean, I'll be honest, I'm guilty. I get this weird, you know, drive by, see the, whatever, the, whatever the billboards, you know, make a million, hundred million, zillions, whatever dollars, whatever. What if I had, you know, and stuff. And, and my son's kind of, Nine now, he has that presence of mind. What would you do? You know, you know he's, he's weird. I just out there in the world and other places. But what would you do? You got this, that, and the other. You know what I mean? And, and I give him different answers, maybe than what he's expecting. Or answers that he's heard. Generally, I try to give him different answers. But I mean, real, you know, things that line up with what the Word of God speaks of. You know, but um, you know, it's it's it's. Very simple. You know, it also speaks of in Malachi, the description, uh, God describes the people as being robbers of him for not bringing what he said to bring into the storehouse, you know, the tithe and the offering. People try to get hung up on this tithe. That's Look, God says tithe and offering. This is, uh, and, and we see in that text, if you go back and read there in Malachi, that, that, uh, so that they wouldn't be cursed. He wants to bless them. You know, bless those who subscribe to that. You know, and, he's, and he is telling them you are cursed with a curse because of this. Very specifically, that's just what God's word says. And so there's a generous heart, and then there's that priority that God gives to uh, what, what our, where our treasure is. Jesus talks about it like this. He says, you know, where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. I can tell a lot about a person um, in a lot of ways, and I don't, you know, I'm not saying to go around and judge people in this way, and I don't. But I mean, you can tell where a person puts their resources, their time, their talent, their treasure, where they invest those resources at. You can tell really, really what's inside of their heart and what they're about. Where they spend their time, their money, and their treasure, or their time, their talent, and their treasure. You really can tell where a person is at. And I don't care what they say. <laughs> you know, this is this leads into the next part of this. You know, the perjurer, the person that lies on their oath or swears falsely by his name. You know, it's interesting in Jude. If you read that little tiny page, if you want to call it a book, <laughs> one page has had a goal like 15 years ago. Remember, I was a book of Jude. I felt guilty, uh, but uh, <laughs> it's just such a short book. Like, dude, I can just totally memorize this. But it talks about in that book the, the, the clouds without water. You know, that's that's a good biblical description 
of a person that says something about who they say, oh, I'm this, you know, and then they don't bring rain. You know what I mean? And I say, you know, people describe that as some, something else too. But, but you know, but it's, 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 it's something to be said about, you know, that, 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 that a curse is coming, comes upon them according to what God is saying here. And I, I feel like, you know, we get into, and this is one reason, and I'm not against anything, like uh, there's some beautiful, blessed, spiritual, awesome stuff. And, um, and, and I glean even from things that go around in some what we call today's uh, charismatic type places. And, uh, and I glean stuff from that. You know, some, of these people, some of these people are really connecting to the Lord, connecting to the Holy Spirit, and they're being blessed. And God's doing a great work there. But man, when people just start, the Lord did, the Lord did, the Lord did, the Lord did. You know what I mean? Just all the time. It's a little bit like, you know. I'm not, I'm more, more, want to be more careful myself. You know? I don't want to just say something that's, that's God right there and it doesn't happen. You know, I'm in danger of falsely, you know, you know, swearing his name and using his name falsely. And, you know, and that's what's being talked about here <coughs> in this text. That the curse will be upon those people until it consumes them. And you know, this is actually the flip side of this. I mean, look at that. That's kind of negative. But the flip side of that is, is, in fact, in a lot of ways, spiritually, you know, when when I first came to Christ, and I, and I look at it in hindsight, I know a lot of it, I attribute a lot of it to, I mean, just God working on behalf of His people, but there's a lot of people praying for me and whatnot. But, you know, I remember, um, I remember my mom and, you know, different people praying for me, but a lot of things that were prayed, was that I would come to the end of my rope. You know, and, and, and it actually is not, you know, we talk about the prayers in the Psalms. I know Pastor Dave's been teaching through the Psalms some, and some of those prayers aren't necessarily prayers that you want to pray. And, uh, <laughs> but that I think there's something mixed in that is spiritually right. And it's not in a negative, like you got to guard your heart on this stuff, obviously. But it's not like, you know, when you hope somebody, you know, fails. In that sense, we, we, I don't necessarily want it to be like that. I mean, obviously, the goodness of God leads to repentance, and that's the, the Lord's heart as well. <laughs> but there is a reality to, like, man, I hope in this life that they experience some of the consequences of their sin now, like people that aren't following Jesus, that don't know the Lord. I hope they experience it to a certain degree that to, to, to wake them up. Like, you start experiencing a curse in your life, you know? Like, when I started experiencing, when I was not saved, and just, just I saw the people in the drug culture dying that I had made deals with, and like, oh, you know, this guy's young, you know? And, and then seeing people just, just, just kind of, like, oh, willy-nilly, just following the world, not, not caring, giving two cents about anything. That, that started putting a heart check in me a little bit. <laughs> just, just thinking, man, I mean, you know, if that person can get come to Christ in this life, you know, I mean, what, what, what could happen that could wake them up, you know, maybe there is a disaster, maybe there is a storm, maybe there is a difficulty they need to be experiencing as a part of their sin now, so they don't receive the consequence eternally, I mean, I want that, you know, and in a similar way of doing this raising my kids, I told it to my son, and he's nine, and my little guys are just too little to understand it. Maybe even that are older kids understand this too, but I'd rather them experience the, the pain of me disciplining them because I actually care about them versus them going into the world and then getting, you know, people that don't care about them at all, you know, like a bad boss or uh, a girl that, you know, has no interest in mind, you know, for, 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 for the other person. I'd rather them see the brunt of that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Brunt for me than from that. Because I love them. You know? And so there's there is a a thing God allowing them to experience this curse for the violation of these basically the Ten Commandments we just spoke of a little bit there. The curse that goes over the whole earth, but also specifically to those lying in their oath, those that are thieves, those things that we mentioned there. All right, so back to our text, vision number two, or number seven, if you're counting these. Verse five. 
It says, uh, Zechariah 5, 5. It says, Then the angel who talked with me came out and he said to me, Lift your eyes up now and see what this is that goes forth. And I, I kind of wondered, like, <coughs> systematically this is happening. <laughs> it was just like, bang, 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 bang. you know, like one hit vision after another. Or is there a delay? I mean, I kind of wanted that, but I don't know. Maybe some of you deep students can hook, hook me up with that later the information last if I don't know something there. But it says in verse 5, Then the angel who talked with me came out and said to me, Lift your eyes up now, see what this is to go for. Verse 6, so I asked, what is it? And he said, it is a basket that is going forth. Now, this basket, the Hebrew translation is uh, epaph, which is um, in the Hebrew biblical times, is one of the largest dry measurements that they utilized. And, uh, it was about 39 quarts, American quarts, is just sort of a comparable of, you know, so this is what he's seeing. It's not like a little Easter basket or something like that. I don't know what's got in mind when you see the word basket, but that's, that's what the, the biblical context of what it is there. That's one part. Then he said, also said, this is their resemblance throughout the whole earth. Now, if you have a newer translation, a new living translation, or NIV, it says this is their iniquity that goes throughout the whole earth. And so it's a little more descriptive of being sin. This is the basket that goes forth and this is the sin that goes throughout the whole earth. So it's it's predicating what's in the basket as being sin that affects the earth and planet. Verse 7. Here is a lead that is lifted up. And this is a woman, woman sitting inside of the basket. Then he said, this is wickedness. You know, it's name for this lady. <laughs> and he thrust her down into the basket and threw the lead to cover it over its mouth. And so uh, in that word wickedness, there is a, in the, a feminine derivative uh, in the Hebrew. And it also you know, fits with the text, the woman sitting inside the basket. Uh, let's go on there, verse 9. And then I raised my eyes and I looked. And there were two women coming with the wind in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the basket between the heaven, the earth and heaven. And so I said to the angel who talked with me, where are they carrying the basket? And this kind of helps define the meaning, so I'll read through it all. Verse 11, and he said to me, to build a house for it in the land of Shinar, when it is ready, basket will be set there on its base. So we're seeing this, you know, I mean a basket like an old 39 quarts, it's a very large basket of woman inside. Angel has the lid thrown over it, and then these two women, they have stork wings, you know, so and this isn't a baby. <laughs> Pandora, right? You know, in the box. She's been let out in some ways. We'll talk about that here in a minute. But uh, they, they take back to the land of Shinar. Now, you know, as, as we get into this, it just seems like real bizarre, right? You know, if you have visions, <laughs> like this, it's a real bizarre vision. But there's uh, some defining things, I believe, that we can gather from this. Now, you would see that last verse there in chapter 5, verse 11. Um, there was to be a house built for it in the land of Shinar. There's um, obviously this, you know, it says it in the name. This is an evil, I think it's an evil spirit that we're talking about specifically. Um, you know, describing Shem in a sense. And it's taken back to the place of Shinar. Shinar is also, um, you know, it's connected to, uh, in some senses, it's a, a district. Uh, I've got a list here of different cities towards Babylon where actually we see in Genesis the Tower of Babel uh, constructed back in chapter uh, Genesis 10 and 11. So this is you know, back in that same area where Shinar would be. Uh, there's also Iraq 
Akkad and Kalel. Kal uh, Ne, sorry, these are like little cities in that given area. And this, you know, the house is being built for it could be a temple, could be uh, symbolic of a place of worship for this type of idol. But we also we know from the Tower of Babel that that was an area that God specifically chose to intervene shortly after the flood because mankind had attributed something of themselves in unifying to construct this tower up toward God, toward heaven. Uh, I think it's sort of bragging right mixed in with a mockery toward God. God dispersed that and broke that thing up. But it's also some of this the, the, there could be two meanings as we look at things in Scripture when it comes to the prophets, like a meaning that was meant specific to the prophet for that time period. There are some commentators that lead this direction um, in talking about this is uh, it's a rebuke in connection to the people that were taken up out of Babylon. And they had taken with them a spirit that was similar to what they learned in Babylon, a way of the world, if you will, in the land of Babylon. And they attribute that to being greed and basically materialism. And there is, I think if you draw the picture out a little bit further, I think something you could say there is a there there as it relates to that. If you look at the, in conjunction with this few verses here, connect that to the first vision, there's a lot of what pledging certain things, lying about certain things. You tie that in, obviously it fits well with materialism, but also if you look in the future, we see uh, Babylon mentioned again. Because we know in the Bible, like Jerusalem's number one city mentioned in the Bible. Number two is Babylon. You know, if you look in Revelation chapter 17 and 18, we see the uh, Babylon being mentioned. And it's sort of the epicenter of the wealth of the world. It's sort of the eyepiece for the world to look at. They're like, oh, wow, Babylon, you know, because it ends up God's got breach of judgment havoc up on Babylon. And that's a future event. Same spirit, perhaps, that's connected to those things, or a similar spirit, or a kind of corresponding spirit, to say the least. And so, there, again, there may be some there. there. You know, it's interesting, it's, you know, the wings of a stork. You know, the, there is some stuff as people look at this, the women, the two women that took them back, you know, uh, coming from the winds, where they had wings like the wings of a stork. Some people said it's like a, you know, well, stork's unclean because it's Levitically unclean. So maybe, you know, it was sort of a, you know, God allowing the evil forces work together. But, you know, some of the things, uh, it was kind of interesting, a stork does have like migration patterns that have, uh, some sense that you know if they're taking it from a long distance that's something connected there practically but bottom line is is that this was an evil that was in the midst of god's people that had to be sent back sent away from god's people and it was centered around this this materialism so centered around this greed for gain and as I look at that and I think through those things, I think it's one of the it's one of the hardest things as I start. Uh, I think the Lord's really speaking to me personally a lot about some of these things, but it's um, you know the, the the objectives that we have in this life and in the place that we live right now in human history on planet Earth are severely jaded. Like the spiritual objectives we should have, I believe, are severely jaded because of materialism, because of greediness, because of a desire for a gain on a regular basis. I mean, just the way that our lives are structured. And I'm not condemning anybody. I'm just, just speaking as a person that uh, wants to follow Jesus, who wants to honor God with his life, right? but also realizes that where I'm at, just analytically speaking, by looking at the things, that, that the places that we are, the things that are going on in this life, I feel like in a lot of ways, uh, uh, 
I see that the thorns and the thistles, you know, it talks about in the parable of the sower. God sowed in the parable of the sower, so seed over here, it you know, landed on rock and and so the seed over here, and then there was a bird that swooped it up. And there was that seed that got sown. It came up, and it was choked. Speaking of the Word of God being choked out. And I do think in our society, more than ever, and, I'm, 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 and the Lord's allowed me to go through some stuff here lately, just, and, I, and I'm, I'm grateful. I'm starting to be more, more grateful for it. At first, I'm kind of like, oh, what's going on? No, and I'm starting to battle this stuff in my head and in my heart. But, you know, I'm starting to appreciate it more than coming in here and looking at this study and thinking about things. It's like, you know, really got to get to that place in my walk with Jesus, like Paul was, in that sense of contentment with just, you know, hey, we got, we got food, we got clothes. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, you know I mean, he didn't say air conditioning, and he didn't say, you know, nice portfolio. He didn't say all his other excess stuff. That we that just man and in our culture, I mean, we're just inundated with this just just stuff. You go to Walmart, there's just like crazy just inventions. I ain't mocking it. I ain't saying it's wrong. I ain't saying that's evil in and of itself. But what does it do? Distracts for a minute. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, I was thinking about this, and now I'm thinking about this. You know, and it's like it, it, it can in my head and in my heart. If I'm not letting the Word of God prevail in my life and my willingness to, to, to be a doer of the Word and following what God's trying to tell me to do and walk in the Spirit and be sharing the Gospel, making disciples, discipling my family, you know, discipling you know, people that I serve with and different capacities that I serve with, interacting with you guys and different things. If I'm letting that stuff that's out there continually just take the time cards out of my head and thinking towards the Lord and what the Lord has for me. The Word of God is becoming, I'm allowing, if I will, if I do allow it, it becomes less and less and less fruitful. And I, and I think, you know, um, you guys are, all, are awesome in a lot of ways. It's, you know, I think about our church and, you know, and, and compare it. And I look at other churches, and I'm not against other churches or anything. But the time that it takes to like dig in meticulously and go through the scriptures, so people just got the attention span for some of that these days. I look at and I start talking to somebody about something that maybe I'm looking at, you know, and they're kind of not. They're like, you know, they say they go to church, and what was it, it was Pastor Dave was talking to us recently? It's like the average person now that says that they go to church, that they have a church or something like that, they actually attend like 1.8 times or 1.2 times or something like that. I don't know how point two. If you said just swing by, I got coffee. Only point two times per month. Per month, yeah, that's it. That's it. Point two times per month. And that's, you know, when you think about that in lieu of what we know from God's Word, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it says, as we know God's return is imminent, we should meet more. The frequency should be an increased type thing. If we're dependent on God, we're looking for God, we're going to be among His people, receiving from Him. Being blessed by and all that stuff, right? But we get, man, life gets choked down. Life gets choked down. I think, I mean, pray for these guys as you think of them. I don't think we have any uh, other guys, but you know, I think in the bridge house, you know, we had that ministry going for a while. I noticed a lot of guys would start something and that would take over their life. And it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Like, work's a good thing, right? And they had to try to work six days a week myself. And, Trying to stay at six, you know, trying to bleed over in the seven too much lately. But, <laughs> but, but, you know, it's, but, it's, um, but that, you know, in and of itself, and trying to keep up with the expectations that our culture is constantly just laying out for us. You know, you should have this retirement plan, you should have that thing going on, you should have that house by now, you should have this library, you should have these investments over here. And I think even right now, as I'm staring at you guys and talking about this stuff, I think like three or four opportunities that are just sitting there dangling. Right in front of me, like, like wind chimes or something, just dangling in front of me. And it's like, you know, man, you know, I don't feel like there's certain areas in my walk with Jesus, like at the home level, and my kids' level, and the children's ministry level. I was like, you know what, man, these things aren't where I feel like the Lord wants them to be at. Those have to take higher priority than this, you know. 
stuff that's <laughs> dangling in front of me. And, you know, will those opportunities exist that later? Maybe not. You know? Um, will I be able to buy from my house? I trust God. I can trust the Lord. I mean, if I'm doing my work, you know, I know, I know it provides me the need to have an attitude, heart, to trim myself down and stay focused on the root of my relationship with Jesus and being rooted in His Word, rooted in love, established among other believers. I think people that I miss opportunities to see in the hospital from time to time, I'm like, man, if you got one of them, am I chasing the chimes? Am I chasing the ding, dangling? culture in front of me. Am I? I ain't saying that. It always is the case for not doing something. But these are questions that I have to really allow to purge my soul. And I think it's it's the thing, you know, it's intended in this chapter. These were purging things to purify the people. There are things that you know encourage us just as American believers, as far as Jesus to to to, to be wrestling with the Lord over some of these things, you know. Because um, you know, when, when it's all said and done, you know, I, I want to look at, I look at, you know, you do this if you do budgeting, right? You look at your money, like if you actually collect receipts and start doing this every time, you think, well, dang, man, I done spent like $50 on like drinks. There's a water fountain right there. What am I doing? You know? <laughs> it's like, but do you think of your time like that? I spent, you know, whatever, was it 50 minutes? Think about that, you know, instead of interceding here or praying over this or thinking, God, what are you trying to save me in my life here? You know, spend an hour, you know, watching this, that. And I ain't saying don't, you know what I mean. I ain't saying don't do this, don't do that. Just, just, just I'm looking at this analytically and I'm thinking in my heart and my head, Lord, am I sharp? Am I ready? Am I, am I that tool that, that's ready to be pulled out at any time for the king? Right? I'm just ready to write the divine word to somebody. Am I ready? Am I making myself ready? You know, sometimes I'm ready and I don't even think I'm ready. You know, God does something and I'm like, oh yeah, I just walk off and I didn't even know he's doing it. <laughs> you know, it's like, later somebody like, wow man, I just changed my life. Like, really? Me too. <laughs> but, uh, but, and the Lord's good. The Lord's good. He's gracious. I don't want you to be thinking about walking with eggshells or anything like that. He's gracious. He's good. You know, yeah. Get caught up in being legalistic about this stuff, but it is something in our day and age. We those literally I'll just leave on this one note: is um, we live in the most prosperous age in human history has ever experienced, ever, ever. You know, and in the midst of that, was was the Lord telling us to do? Was the Lord telling us to do? You see, it's all going to go down bad. And, you know, look at Babylon, Revelation 17 and 18. And, you know, it's all that's gone, you know. And then here, the Lord graciously puts a lid on that lady, sent that thing back to Babylon, right? And maybe that's what the Lord is wanting to do. He's wanting to cast that spirit of covetousness, that spirit of greed, the need for this, that, and the other materialism. Put a lid on that thing, Lord, and give me some women with stork wings and fly that stuff back to, <laughs> you know, wherever it needs to go, you know. Um, but um, we, need, we, just, we need to consider these things. Consider what the Lord's wanting to do in our life, right? I'm going to close in prayer, and um, and we can turn that thing off if you want. We can, guys, we can get together in like maybe twos and threes or something, and uh, we can just have a time of prayer. We're trying to encourage one another. All right, let me pray. God, thank you for uh, the book of Zechariah. Thank you for Lord, this time period in, in history that took place and how you chose to speak and give vision to, to a man about purging the people and, and getting them on course with you, Lord. Not because you're mad at them, but because you love them. Because you love them. And Lord, you love us. And, and, and you want the best for us, just like any good father wants the best for his kids, he wants the best for us. And Lord, we want to, in turn, give our lives over to you fully. Lord, I pray that, Lord, there's 
I know there's thoughts and there's things that I think about, Lord, that's just taking up real estate in my mind and in my brain. It doesn't even need to be there. God, I pray that you would remove it. I pray you do that for my brothers who may be struggling with something as well. Lord, there's, there's, there's a way of life that you have that's filled with the Holy Spirit. It's abundant. It's filled with peace that passes knowledge. It's filled with joy unspeakable. That is eternal significance. God, I want that life with you. You've already purchased me into it. You know, my flesh gets in the way of it. And God, I just, I just pray that you would uh, remove these spirits from us. Remove that evil that seeks to invade our life or to distract us from being fruitful in the Word. And Lord, we just, we just lift up our hearts now. Lord, I pray that we just have a real moment with one another, Lord. And very few moments we can actually get like this, God, where we just, hey, you know what? What's going on later? What have heard? My bro needs me. I need my bro. We just need to pray. We need you, Jesus. Two or more gathering together, interceding. And I pray that uh, where you would continue to knit hearts together, that you would build bridges among these men that would thwart the plans of the enemy. And that, uh, and God, that we would see your hand move, Lord, as we pray, as, as we seek you, that we see your hand work. You give us glimpses of your hand working in our midst. That you would be glorified. You'd be encouraged when you're glorified. So we lift up the rest of the night to you in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen.